So just to remind you uh, what we're doing, on Friday, we started the discussion on hydraulic fracturing. So we had sort of just a big picture overview lecture where I talked about and showed some quantitative information about the impact of hydraulic fracturing uh, in the U.S. and our relationship to other countries in terms of oil production and even specifically Texas. Um, and then we talked about sort of an overview of how hydraulic fracturing operations are conducted. And then we had a real short discussion of sort of environmental impacts or a short address of the kind of hot button issues that you hear about, earthquakes and uh, water contamination and these kind of things. And we also had a little short economic discussion in there. But I, I was such tangent to the uh, rest of the talk that when I posted the video, I cut that out. So if you weren't here and you watched the video, you won't hear that part. Um, so what we're going to do over the next, well, basically the rest of the semester, we're going to start today. We're just going to have a basic lecture on sort of elementary fracture mechanics. And I assume none of you had a course in fracture mechanics, right? Has anyone had a class in fracture mechanics? Probably not. It's usually a class you wouldn't take. Even if you were, say, a mechanical engineer or uh, aerospace engineer, you probably wouldn't take it until graduate class anyway. So, so we'll have a sort of a, a big picture or a, this elementary fracture mechanics lecture today, and that's probably all we'll get to. Now, most fracture, uh, hydraulic fracture design tools these days are computational. And they range from, you know, very sort of small extensions to analytic models, uh, to you know some of the stuff we're doing in the research groups in this department, you know, fully coupled geomechanical simulators that try to include all the physics, multi-phase flow, uh, you know, probably too much physics uh, in terms of what's really important. Um, so that's sort of the state of the art of most of the commercial fracture simulators. Uh, that you'll actually use to do fracture design have some varying degrees of complexity between a simple extension to an analytic model to fully coupled finite element type simulator. Um, there are a few analytic models. And the analytic models are worth discussing because they're full of assumptions. They have to be to sort of make them tractable. Uh, but they are useful for a couple of things. Uh, one, they're useful verification problems for the computer models, right? Um, you, you should be able to take your really complex computer model and make enough simplifications or basically put enough zeros in the inputs to get it to reduce to one of the analytic models or get it close to one of the analytic models and show that it converges to the analytic models in some limit. Uh, and that, that offers a good verification to make sure that you actually implemented the computer code correctly, right? It's doing what you think it's doing. Um, the analytic models also offer insight, right? The, you know, you can see, uh, you know, if, if certain parameters are under square root signs, they're probably not, you know, the, you know, whatever your design variable is, probably not sensitive to that parameter or less sensitive than other ones. So they, they offer some insight into the, what the importance of the different parameters that go into the model. And so we'll, we'll discuss the, those, I mean, there's essentially uh, two kind of classic, most used, the, the KGD model and the PKM model. And so we'll, we'll talk about those two models at least. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about the, you know, the computer models. Um, so th these, these range from things that you might hear like pseudo 3D models to more and more advanced. And we'll just cover those at a high level. I'm not going to ask you to, certainly not to code anything up and really not even solve problems, but just to be aware of the different tools that you can use. Um, in terms of the analytic models, we, we will solve some problems using those models. And so that's what essentially we're going to be doing for the rest of the semester. So let's talk about fracture mechanics. Fractional mechanics was really born around 1920, 21. There was a guy named Griffith. I 
Griffith was an aeronautical engineer. I think he worked for the Navy. Um, and 1921 is kind of significant date because just a few years after World War I. And World War I was the first time that airplanes were used other than anything kind of a novelty, right? I mean, it was sort of the, the first time when airplanes were really used. They were used in combat, they were used for transport and other things. Uh, and so now the United States had a significant number of aircraft in the fleet, and they were already st starting to get old, right? They were starting to age. And so then a worry became of how do we take care of these aircraft as they age? And one of the most significant problems with aging aircraft, even to this day, has to do with fracture. Okay. So how many of you think when you fly in an airplane that there are no fractures? Yeah, anywhere. You think there are zero fractures in the airplane? Well, you hope there are. You know, but uh, the reality is they're not. Right? There's fractures, a lot of fractures. I'm a pilot, actually. I inspect the aircraft before I go fly, and I look at the fractures. <laughs> Hopefully, they're stopped. You know, you, you, they're they're taken care of. But right, so this was not that long ago. In 2011, in Southwest Flight 812 or something like that, April 1st, 2011, which made me think maybe that's a maybe the passengers on the plane thought it was some kind of April, April Fool's joke, you know. But uh, the 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 plane experienced a a tear in the fuselage and a rapid decompression. And so, you know, when, when they tell you to put your oxygen mask on, hopefully they, they were paying attention. And um, so here's the tear in, in the fuselage. So this was a, a fatigue crack that sort of had gotten away from them. Right? The beauty, I mean, the nice thing about airplanes, they're designed in such a way that, that the, the cracks will be arrested in certain panels. And so this sort of did its job. And no one was hurt except there's a funny anecdote, I thought. I mean, it's not funny. I guess people were kind of hurt. But you know that you know when you, I fly a lot, so I, I sort of have these little PA address things memorized. And they always tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before, you know, before you help your kids or, or other people who need assistance. Well, the two people that were hurt on this airplane were flight attendants. And both of them didn't put their oxygen mask on. One of them was talking on the PA. Telling the, telling the passengers to put their oxygen masks on, and he passed out. And when he passed out, because of lack of oxygen, when he passed out, he hit his head. And, uh, and then another flight attendant ran to help him, and she passed out. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not, I guess it's not that funny, but it, it's sort of ironic. They always tell you to, to put your oxygen mask on before you help someone, and then they, they didn't follow their own instructions. So, anyway. So, so this guy Griffith, uh, who was sort of the first guy to worry about fractures, and you know we, we haven't really talked about fracture mechanics in this class other than just briefly mention it when we were talking about drilling induced tensile fractures, and you know we basically said that the strength of the rock and tension doesn't matter, um, but I, I do want to point out that when we talk about the strength of the rock and tension, that's really I mean. While we may not say it explicitly, what we're really talking about there is the strength of sort of a homogeneous material without flaws, right? But all rocks have flaws. And so uh, really, in, in tension, any, th the failure of any rock is going to be governed by the cracks or the flaws that are in there and their resistance to propagation. And that's what the subject of fracture mechanics deals with. The strength of the material or the material's resistance to fractures that do exist, they're already there, and they propagate. So, so this guy Griffith, he did a set of experiments. So he just had a sample. He applied some load. The sample had a crack in it. And Typically in fracture mechanics, when when the crack has two tips, so this is like a center crack, it has two tips, you know, one on each end. Um, we 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 call the crack length 2a, as opposed to 
Sometimes we'll also deal with samples that just have one, one, for one tip, so it's like a side notch. So in this case, the fracture length would just be A. Whenever it has two tips, it's 2A. Whenever it has one tip, it's, it's A. All right. So Griffith went to the lab, and he had a bunch of samples prepared. They all had fractures in it. He pulled on them, he pulled on them, he pulled on them. And for a wide range of materials, and these were metals, okay, but different metals, you know, uh, for a wide range of materials, he realized that there was some constant that was proportional to the applied load and the square root of the crack length. Okay, so some, and so again, because this occurred over a wide range of materials, you might begin to suspect that whatever that constant is is some sort, some sort of material property. Okay. So just like we have Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, this is a material property, or, or what we're going to look for is a material property that governs. The, the cracks resistance to property, an existing flaw. Okay. So, with that, we're just going to make some energy arguments. Let's take our center crack plate. Crack length 2A. Our sample length is L. We're going to apply a load to it. Right. And so, I mean, you might think of this as one way. If you sort of from a static analysis, you might you might think that on on this side of the crack, there's some spring that stores elastic energy, and then I'll just draw a box or something that goes on with the crack, and then there's another spring here, and then we apply a load. And so what we want to do, I mean, we know from physics, right, how to write the energy associated with a spring. Okay. So it's sort of what we want to do here. We're going to do like a static energy balance. Okay. And when we talk about you know, stored elastic energy, it's a potential energy, right? I mean, a spring has potential energy. If I ever compress the spring, there's some stored potential energy. And so with that, we usually, because when we talk about potential energies, it's common to use the symbol U. Right? So, so we're going to say that there's some U. We're going to write down an energy balance. Right? There's some U associated with the elastic energy, right? associated with the springs in that picture, if you will. Okay? And then there's some energy associated with creating new surfaces. That's sort of what's in that box. This is dealing with our crack. So there's some energy, right? There's some free energy that's going to be released when we create a new surface. And then that's going to be equal to, or if we move it to the left-hand side of the equation, we're going to say minus the external work, or I might just say, since I used L up there, I'll just say the work due to loading. And that's equal to zero. Okay. And then we're just, what we want to see is how this energy balance changes as a function of crack growth. Right? So we're going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to A. Right? So A is the crack length. So we take the derivative of both sides of the equation with respect to A, and I'm just going to regroup some of the, the terms. So we're going to have the energy associated with crack growth new surfaces, elastic energy minus that. And you'll see why I grouped them like that in a second. But basically, th these are the terms that have to do with the kind of mechanical loading, the, the internal forces associated with the elasticity of the material, the, ex the external load, and that has to do with the crack. Right. So the work due to loading, external work, from Physics 101, what is, what is the definition of work from physics? Force times distance, right? Force times distance. So 
force times distance. And this, this distance is the displaced distance, right? It's the distance we move something. So in this case, we're going to apply a load to the end, and we're going to stretch the plate, essentially. Right? And so and, and to be consistent with kind of notation terminology we've used in the rest of the class, we'll say this is a force times delta L. Or I guess I should say that you know this this plate has some cross sectional area A, right? So the force this is this is a static problem, right? So the force has to be the load times the area, right? That's force. So the stress do the loading <coughs> times the area. And then I'm gonna write delta L as the strain times L. Times L. And that comes from our 1D definition of engineering strain, right? Remember we said in one dimension strain is change in length over length over length. Right? So I'm just solving this equation for delta L, plugging it in there, and then I have this equation. So the potential energy due to the elasticity in the sample is it's like the area under the stress strain curve, right? So we have a stress strain curve. Here we're just talking about an elastic material, right? So the stress strain curve for an elastic material is going to look like that. What's the slope of that line? Young's modulus. So I just need the area under this curve, right? So what's the area under a tri what's the area of a triangle? One half base times height, right? So in this case, one half the stress times the strain. And this is actually an energy density. This is an energy density, so this is like a point-wise quantity, and we have to essentially, to get the total energy in the whole body, we need to sum it up uh, you know, over the whole body. Essentially, in this case, that means we multiply by the volume, because it's a, we're assuming this is homogeneous, it's a constant, right? So this, this exists point-wise everywhere, so then we multiply by the volume, and the volume is just A L. Right. So then let's just look at something. If we if we take what we derive W L and we divide it by U E, right, so basically take this, put it in the numer numerator, just rearrange it a little bit to be so to be more clear. And then put this in the dominator. We see that that term and that term cancel, so this equals 2. Right. So another way to say that then would just be that uh, WL is equal to 2 UE. Right. And then Take that equip guy, stick it back over here. So that my equation becomes So the rate of change of the energy associated with creating new surfaces with respect to crack length is equal to the rate of change of 
internal energy with respect to plugging. Elastically. Okay. So the energy associated with creating new services is equal to two, and there's two because it's as we extend the crack, we create two surfaces, one on the top, one on the bottom. So it's equal to two times the length of the crack, in our case, 2a, times what we'll say is gamma. Gamma is the specific surface energy. So this is the increase in free energy per unit area. It's very much like an analogy with surface tension in a fluid. All right. Times the width of the crack. So we're going to just normalize this by uh, width. All right. So divide by width so that we have US over width is equal to 4a gamma. And then the internal energy divided by width for a sample with a crack in it and assuming plane strain. Okay, and I'll talk about I'll come back to the plane strain comment in a second. This is, a, this is an equation that was derived uh, was derived by this guy Inglis in 1923. And so the plane strain assumption, we didn't really talk a lot about plane elasticity in this class, but we did sort of use the plane strain assumption. You used it on your homework three uh, when you derived the equation, uh, um, the, the uh, equation for where you, where you relate, you assume that the, the two principal stresses, the two horizontal principal stresses were equal, right, and then there was no strain. And you used it in that case. So this is a, an assumption that's typically used when uh, you want to take a, a 3D, something you know, we know the equations for 3D, right? We talked about them. Uh, if you want to take that and you want to approximate it as a two-dimensional thing, and the plane strain assumption is useful when something, when one of the directions is very, very thick. Right? And so, if you if you assume that whatever, you know, your coordinate system is, and say like so the z direction is very, very thick, such that there's no strain in that direction, right? So, if you had sigma zz is approximately equal to zero. And this comes from, the, if it's very thick, right, our, our definition of strain in one dimension is like change in length over length. Well, if it's very, very thick, then the original length is big, right? Big. Right. So if the, if the original length is very, very big, it's very thick, then you have some small change in length, and this thing is going to be approximately equal to zero. Okay. So that's the plane strain assumption. And this equation was derived for a 2D rectangular body, um, or I'm sorry, I guess semi-infinite body, in fact, uh, 2D with a crack in the middle. That's the elastic energy for plane strain. Right? So now let's we can put those into our equation. Remember, our equation is this. This, they're both normalized by the width, and the width is not a function of a, so just get rid of them.
And then we'll solve this equation for 2 gamma. And we typically call 2 gamma G. G, this is called the strain energy release rate. 